Hi, I'm Judge Frank Caprio. You are now watching the Growing Up Italian podcast. Because they traded the kid Ben Attendi. They had the kid Ben Attendi. Oh, yeah. He went to the Yankees after. Well, he, he, um, then he went with the Royals, though? He was Royals first. He's with, he's right? with the White Sox now. Yeah. He's with the Chicago White Sox. He's a Paisan. <laughs> and every day, including today, I check his the, box, the box score. So yesterday he got four hits. What else? Yeah. He only scored one run. He got, but they got four. So I check his box score every day. But he's, only, he's batting 260. 260 is good in today's game, though. Like I said, guys bat 220, and it's like... I'm used to, like, when the DiMaggio was playing. Ted know? Williams, these guys bat... Williams. I met Williams. Yeah? Good guy. Real good guy. Yeah. You lived a crazy life. I had a good life. I feel like you have stories enough for, for everybody <laughs> in this room. How was it meeting Ted Williams? Good friend, a good friend of mine. Uh, I was running for attorney general in 1970. And the first day in the campaign, this 14-year-old kid came in. His name was Mark Weiner. I said, who's this kid? What's he doing here, right? And they said, he just came. He wants to help. So we sent him on errands. To make a long story short, he became, he became a very influential person, only because he was such an aggressive kid, very smart, you know, and he was very loyal to me. So 1976, Jerry Brown was the governor of California, and and it was a presidential election when Jimmy Carter got elected. Mm -hmm. So there was a presidential primary. I'm a delegate to the convention for Scoop Jackson. Mm -hmm. Jackson falls out of the race, and we have a slate of delegates who are committed to Scoop Jackson for president. My friend Mark somehow gets a job in the White House with Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. And through his connections, and that's how... We met all these so people. you brought him around, and he, he got you to meet Ted Williams. One, day, one, no, I, I introduced him to Ted Williams. So one day you introduced him to Ted Williams. I'll tell you the story. Yes, this is an interesting story. So one day I, I'm with him, and he's he's a very anxious kid, and he's on, he's always on two phones. He's on the phone, and we have to go somewhere. I, I say, Mark, hurry up! He hangs up. I said, What the hell are you doing? You know, we have to be somewhere. He says, I was busy on the phone. I said, Who are you talking to? And he mentioned some Italian guy's name. And I says, who's he? He said, he's chairman of the board of Mr. Coffee. I said, Mark, you know I'm trying to get DiMaggio's signature on my baseball. I said, why didn't you, why don't you see if you could arrange that? Well, I'm going back in this story. When I was six years old, Babe Ruth came to Rhode Island. He had me tied, and he was putting on a hitting exposition in East Providence. My, father, my dad took my brother and I to see him hit the balls. We got there early, and Babe Ruth came over to my father and says, who are these two young kids? And he's ruffling our head. And Babe Ruth called over. They said, bring over two balls. So the guy brings over two balls. Babe Ruth autographs two balls. He gives one to my brother, one to me. I keep the ball in pristine condition. Hank Aaron breaks Ruth's record. A good friend of mine who played baseball with Hank Aaron, you know, I call him and say, I want Aaron's signature on the ball. On the same ball? Same ball, so, because he broke the record. Mm -hmm. So we go to Fenway Park. He was uh, Hank Aaron's there. He gets me to sign Wow. for Hank Aaron. So you have Hank Aaron and Babe Ruth I have on Hank Aaron and Babe Ruth. However, I, I'm part owner of a restaurant in Narragansett. It's a seaside restaurant. And one day, who walks in? Ted Williams. He was fishing down in the, in the area called Galilee in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I run home, I get the ball, and I'm, with some trepidation, I approach Williams. He was very cordial, and I asked him if he would sign the ball, and he signed the ball. I want one more signature. I want Joe D. I want Joe D on that ball. I want Joe D. So getting back to Mark Weiner, he's on the phone mm -hmm. with this guy who, who owns Mr. Coffee, and DiMaggio was doing the commercials for Mr. Coffee. So it, he calls, calls the fellow back. So it says, DiMaggio said, uh, he said, he says, we're having a, um, 
corporate meeting in Chicago next week. He says, fly there and I'll get the module to sign the ball. Right. So now, then the, the, uh, the uh, Mr. Coffee guy calls back and says, I talked to DiMaggio. He says, you're in Providence. Instead of going to Chicago, he's staying at the Sher Sheridan Center. He had a suite in the Sheridan Center. He says, go there next Tuesday, 11 o'clock. There's no texting back then, so you actually had to follow appointments. So I have an 11 o'clock appointment with DiMaggio. So Mark Wine says, I want to come. Mark is this big. He's like me? <laughs> no, he's a little bit bigger. <laughs> now my, uh, my partner at the, at the restaurant... He's like 6'4". He says, I want to come. My bartender is, has been a Yankee fan since he was born. His kids used to dress in Yankee uniforms to go to school. He says, I want to come. So the four of us go to 11 o'clock shop. I'm in the lobby. I called the phone. Mr. DiMaggio, it's Frank Caprio. He said, yes, come right up. I mean, wait a minute. I have a camera around my neck and the ball in this box. Mark has got two books and a briefcase. Everybody else has got tons of stuff they want the Maggio to sign. So we go up. I press the little button on the door. The Maggio opens the door. He sees four guys with all this stuff. He looks at us. I swear his life passed before his eyes. <laughs> he said, I hardly expected an entourage. I mean, he was really upset. So I'm saying, I got to get this ball signed. So I said, Mr. DiMaggio, I said, I'm sorry. You know, I said, I didn't mean to upset you. If you would sign the ball, we don't have to come in. He said, oh, no, come in. Anyway, again, I says, no, we don't have to come in. Come in. I had two couches. Right? One sat four people. The other sat six people. We're so nervous, we sit in the couch for four people. We're sitting like this. And we start this conversation. Right? And so he, uh, everything we said, he contradicted. I mean, it was not like a nice conversation. It was very, it was difficult. It was cold. Very cold. It was chilly. Actually, it was freezing. So, <laughs> so finally, I forget, someone says, uh, Joe, you know, that, your 56-game hitting streak, you know, that will never be broken. So he tripped up a little bit. And I said, hey, yeah, I says, Joe, I, I read in the newspaper, Billy Martin says he has one of the bats that you used. My, he didn't have that. He don't have my bat. He said, he said, I only used two bats. He says, one I gave to Lou Costello, the comic, Abbott and Costello. Yeah, yeah. And the other I gave to a Catholic church. He don't have my bat. Right, and he, I said, yeah. I says, uh, I said, I hear that right after that you hit. And I forget how many more games consecutive. I think another twenty. And the Maju went into this big speech about Ken Keltner. He hated Ken Keltner because Keltner played him deep down third baseline, hugging the bag. And the Maju hit two screaming line drives down third base, and Keltner was playing almost in left field, not a little further up, and he threw him out. Very close at first base on both of those. That's how he stopped his streak. And yeah, I know I never knew that story. And I, did he hit, like, get on another streak right after that? Like, the day he didn't get any hits, he went on another yeah, he streak. Said, he said he went for, like, another, another 20 streak. games. Not, not, oh, another 20. Yeah, another 20. Yeah, another, I forget the exact number, but it was about 20. But it, it would have been in the 80s, his hitting streak. Imagine that, like, 76 yeah. out of 77. Yeah. That's probably even more impressive than 56 in a row. I, I don't know. He got thrown out from left field? No, no, no. It was, right like, a it was like a he, he shift. Just, it was played, third base, but he, he played, played back. He played a deep third base, and he hugged the line because he, oh. he knew DiMaggio pulled. Yeah, that's a shift he, back in the yeah. day. So he, he played deep behind the bag on third base, and DiMaggio hit the ball so hard that he was able to get him out right, right, right. of his base. So then he eventually signed your ball? Well, I got, now I can tell you that story. So Actually, I, I heard a, an interview that Ken Keltner had on, on the radio shortly after that, and Keltner told, said the same story. He said, I go to functions, DiMaggio won't talk to me. So, oh, my God. Yeah. People hold grudges, though. <laughs> he, held, he held them. He held on Four to guys them. would all... So now we're, now we're, we're talking more. And a friend of mine, before I left, said, my father knows DiMaggio. He said, when my father goes to Vegas, you know, he plays golf with DiMaggio. So when you see DiMaggio, you know, he says, mention my father's name. You know, he says... You know, it's always very risky, by the way. You think? Whenever anybody says to me, tell them you know me, it never works out. <laughs> so, now things are going so bad in this conversation, I'm going to pull the ace out of my sleeve. Oof. I'm going to mention my friend's father's name. Was it an ace or a joker? <laughs> I thought it was an ace. Was <laughs> <laughs> and I, says, I said, Joe, we have a mutual friend. He said, yeah, who was that? And I told him the guy's name. He said, him. He owes me money. I said, what? 
He says, do you know what he did? I, I said, no, Joey. He said, I don't, DiMaggio said, he said, I have no paraphernalia. He said, my uniform is in the Hall of Fame. A few of the things I had left are in the Hall of Fame. Everything else I either gave away or was stolen. He said, I have nothing left. He says, he, he says they stole my World Series rings. Oh, my God. That guy? He, he said they. He says, and he tried to sell me back one of my rings for ten thousand dollars. Nice. And I said, Joe, I never liked him anyway. He was he was a snake. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good save. That was a good save. <laughs> what was I gonna say? <laughs> I didn't even know him. It was some kid. He said, he said my father knows him real well. So, do you know do you know the rapper Drake? He said Drake. Drake from Toronto, you ever heard oh, yeah, of him? Yeah. No, you really know him? No, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I know who he is. I mean like, do I know him? He sees him in the same restaurants that he yeah, oh, okay, okay. I just saw but him. The difference is when he's in the restaurant in South Beach, he doesn't know who Drake is, but Drake he knows who he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, I just bumped into Drake in Toronto, but he says a famous line like about women that like they'll show, oh, yeah, this is my friend. But then right after, they'll be like, but yeah, but I don't really like her because she does this, she does that. You know, like, so it's like the same thing. Like, once you got, once he said that he didn't like him, you didn't like him either. Anyway, so the conversation wasn't going anywhere. So I says, you know, I better get this ball signed. Right. I said, Joe, I says, uh, would you like to sign the ball now? I said, no. So he gets up, and he has a, a dresser with six felt-tip pins on it, right, in a fan like this. Mm -hmm. So I'm just about to hand the ball to DiMaggio, and my friend Jim Kelso puts his hand in his pocket and says, Joe, I have a pen. DiMaggio, DiMaggio looked at him like this. He says, I've done this before. <laughs> so That's a great a, line, by the way. He tried to give me a piece. I've done this. He takes the felt tip pen, he signs the ball, right? He looks at his oh, it's pretty good. Puts it back in the box, right? And I, I says, let the fun, let the games begin. All of a sudden, Mark, Joe, can you sign this to yeah. Kathy, my daughter, to Richard, my son? The manager says, what? One more. That's it. Then Kelso, can you sign this? Can you? Anyway, the, the other three of them, they tortured the Maggio for about 10 minutes, and he didn't want to sign. But he did. Not everything. He, he, How many times did they ask him? Well, they kept asking him. Yeah? And then he says, no more. I mean, <laughs> I know. Hey, how you doing, Mark Joe? Can a, I sign Mark the had about 12 things he wanted to sign. He signed two. <laughs> he said, that's it. The next guy. Autographs aren't a big thing anymore. Do you notice that? Yeah, but this was in the 80s. Do people ask you ever ask you for autographs? Every day. Every day still? Mm -hmm. But what's more likely, the autograph or the, can I take a picture with you? Yeah. A lot of pictures. Yeah. Every more day. pictures than autographs. Yeah. Ten times yeah. more. Every, well, everyone has a camera now. So. Yeah, on, the, on their phones. Yeah. So anyway, so now it's a quarter of 12. We, we got there at 11 o'clock. It's the longest 45 minutes of my life. I want to get out. So I said, Joe, thank you very much. I'm immeasurably appreciative. I appreciate your accommodation and best wishes. So he says, where are you going? <laughs> I said, we're going to go to lunch. He said, where are you going? I said, oh, we're going to stay here. I don't know where we were going because I don't know New York. So I'm thinking fast. I said, we're going to have lunch here at the hotel. Right. He said, oh, don't eat here. The food's terrible. He said, go to La Scala. He says, walk out the... I've heard of it. Is this still around? He said, go walk out the hotel, make a right and then a right. He says, it's great. He says, just tell him I sent you. So we go, we sit down, we go to La Scala. And I said, we don't tell him DiMaggio sent us, right? We sit down, my partner says, Give me a, bring a bottle of wine. He says, I need a drink after after this. And next was this celebratory when you guys left the magic? Like, yeah, we met him? Oh, yeah. Or was it like, yeah, oh, no. man, he didn't sign this? No, no, no. I mean, for me, it still was a life's experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I treasure every every second that we were there. But he was very guarded because so many people try to take advantage of him. And I think that's yeah. what it was all about. But what I'm gonna, how I'm going to finish that story about DiMaggio is that once we got in the hotel, uh, once we got in the restaurant, right, about 15 minutes after we sat down, in comes DiMaggio. And he says, join me. And we joined him for the lunch, and he was a different guy. Wow. He was relaxed, and he was accommodating and everything else. But, but he was very, very guarded when we were up in the suite because he didn't know, you know, a lot of people try to take advantage of him. Of course. You know, he was very guarded. But it was a life's experience for me. So I have that ball with DiMaggio. Hank Aaron, Ted Williams, and Joe DiMaggio, and the ball is retired. No one else is going to sign that ball. Where is that ball? It's in a safety deposit box. <laughs> would, you, would you ever sell it? No, it's going to go to my grandson. Even if someone offered you $10 million? No, it's not, not for sale. I love that.
priceless. Yeah, it's not for sale. Do you have like a crazy man cave with all memorabilia and stuff? No. No? No. That's your most prized possession? Well, that's my most prized possession right yeah. now, as far as memorabilia is concerned. Yeah. Judge, I wanted to uh, talk about your Italian background a little bit. Okay. So, so where's your where's your family come from? My father comes from a village of Teano, T-E-A-N-O, and it's okay. in the province of Cassetta. Oh, very close and, by. Yeah. Teano's very famous in Italy because it's where Victor... Victor Emmanuel King and uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi. Oh, okay. Where, yeah. they, where they unified Italy. They, they signed the peace treaty yeah. in uh, 1862 in Teano to unify Italy. So they met on horseback. And so it's a very famous, historically, it's very famous. And so uh, my father was born there. My mother's from Bovino in Italy, which is very close to Naples. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, we, uh, we were in Italy. Uh, short while ago, I guess within the last six months, in my father's village of Teano, they had a big celebration. They had a parade, and they, got, they let the kids out of school. It they celebrated you, right? Yeah, well, they, 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 were, they were welcoming me back. Yeah. And we had an opportunity to visit where my dad was born. That's awesome. It was a very emotional experience for me. You know, my dad was one of ten. Wow. My mother was one of nine. Oh, man. Big family. And there's Caprios everywhere, by the way. Yeah. Super popular last name. Yeah. How'd they find them? They came to Rhode Island when uh, from Italy? I have a great story about that. My grandfather came first to earn enough money. He then sent for my grandmother to come. Right? And when the, I'll just talk about my dad for a second. You know, he, so we went there, and he, the place where he was born actually looked like a cave. Had a dirt floor. And while we were there, you know, I said, let me get my dad's birth certificate. You know, because my dad here, he came here, he was, he was a laborer, you know, and he worked for WPA during the second, during the Roosevelt administration. Then he got his big job. He became a milkman, right? And just a hardworking guy, went to the seventh grade, didn't go beyond that. Very bright, very smart, right? And so I went to the town hall to get his birth certificate. I mean, it was such a, an emotional shock for me. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, you know, uh, what's your pedigree? Where are you from? You know, what's your background? You know, are you aristocracy? Your family in the old country? You know, what did they do? Well, let me tell you my start, my father's start. I got my father's birth certificate, and it said in the birth certificate, I have it here on the desk, it said that his father took him to the town hall with two witnesses, carried my dad, newborn, to register his birth. And the magistrate signed the certificate saying, I, magistrate of the town of Teano, certify that on this day, you know, Antonio Caprio brought, brought the baby to the town hall with two witnesses. Mm -hmm. And he put the witnesses' names. The last sentence of that birth certificate says, and I certify that I have signed the names of the father and the two witnesses because the three of them are illiterate. Wow. So wow. my father started off like living in, on the first floor in a place that looked like a, a cave mm -hmm. with a dirt floor taken to the town hall. My, my grandfather and his best friends, they couldn't read or write Italian. They were illiterate. You know, that's how we started off. It's it's crazy. You know, being Italian American, you hear stories like that, and it it just goes to show that all the success you brought your family, like how how proud your father would be and everyone before him, because who would have thought like stuff like this would be possible? You know, my father would. Uh, Where's that picture? No, the big one. The big one, Simon. Is it behind there? No, the milkman. Yeah. Caserta is southern Italy, right? Yeah, Caserta is Calabria, right, by the way? No, no. Caserta, I know. <laughs> no. Let me see where it is. Caserta, it, we are known as they talk, people who came from Calabria, they call them Calabrese. Yeah, yeah. right? Capodos. 
<laughs> we, that's my mother used to say that. <laughs> we're known as uh, Tianes. Tianes, yeah. Tianes, we're from yeah. Tiano. Right, right, right. So they say, oh, yeah, you're Tianes. So mm-hmm. my grandmother was the president of. Oh, it's kind of close to Napoli. It's a little above Are Napoli. We, well, it's between Rome and. Uh, and and Napoli, yeah. We're, we're between Napoli and Calabria. You are? Salerno. Yeah. Further down. Okay. All right, don't worry, bro. Don't, don't worry, bro. Close the door. Thank you, brother. Listen to this up. What's up, School and Gilles? Listen, if you're enjoying our content, make sure you show some support. Go get our merch. Got some fresh stuff like this shirt right here and a bunch more. We got socks, keychains at grownupitalian.com. Boom. That's uh, You have super humble beginnings, though. Like, yeah. stories like that. Yeah. Yeah. We see that. I keep this picture right there. Mm-hmm. It's usually facing me because I work at it every day. Mm-hmm. So my dad <coughs> started off working, as I indicated, you know, works progress administration. Then he worked in, during the war, he worked in the shipyard. We were building uh, uh, boats down here in, in Quonset Point. And then he got his big job as a milkman. My dad would wake my brother and I up at 4 o'clock in the morning to work on the milk truck. And he said to us every day, if you don't want to do this the rest of your life, you better stay in school and get a college education. If not, you're going to have to do this the rest of your life. You know? And he drove that into us. I keep this right here in the office. This is a picture of my brother and I. You can see how young I am. You see the milk bottles in my brother's hand. You know? And this, this was all... In my heart, in my heart, people say, where, where do you really live? This is how I view myself, right here. You know, I don't, That's why you're successful. I don't view myself as some, anybody special, done anything special in life. I view myself as a kid delivering milk with my dad, right? Three and four story houses every day, four o'clock in the morning, you know, helping my dad and my dad telling me, make sure you stay in school. So we recently were part of this uh, Italian American um, future leadership it? future leaders uh, event, and there was a trivia question, and it said um, which state has the most Italians per capita, <laughs> and you know who the answer was right? It's Rhode Island. Yeah. yeah. So from I have an that, interesting story about that. Yeah, I, of course. That's what I wanted to ask you: is could you tell us well something about Italians in Rhode Island? Yeah, I'm going to tell you a story first, then I'll tell you about the yeah, story of course. in Rhode Island. The United States Senator from Rhode Island, Jack, Senator Jack Reed, was speaking in New Jersey, I don't know, a few years back. And uh, he's, so he, he, he and I were having a conversation, and he said, uh, he told me he was speaking in New Jersey. So I said, Senator, I said, I'm going to give you like one, one statistic, which you probably know. And that is that we have the most uh, Italians, you know, per capita than any other state. So he, uh, he went to New Jersey give the speech and they, they were claiming they had the most <laughs> they had the most Italians they had the most Italians but not per capita no no they had the most Italians per capita the highest percentage yeah exactly yeah. and so uh, the census came out and it was Rhode Island yeah so Rhode Island has the highest actually about six six miles from here there's a town called Johnston J-O-H-N-S-O-N right J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N Johnston yeah. Johnston uh, Rhode Island has the highest percentage of Italians than any other city or town in the country close to Johnston. Here. During the 1980s, they were restoring the Statue of Liberty. And I was asked if I could raise some money t- toward the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. So I had a few f- fundraisers. And shortly after that, I received an invitation to view the sta- that Statue of Liberty while it was still under construction. So I went to New York and they, uh, they there was scaffolding still all around the Statue of Liberty. It was a private tour, and on the way back to New York, they said, would you like to stop at Ellis Island? I said, I'd love to stop at Ellis Island. You know, mm-hmm. I'd love to stop there, right? So we stop at Ellis Island. The next day, I can't wait to talk to my dad. I call him up. I said, Dad, let's have lunch to, to the, uh, tomorrow. He said, sure. So we go to lunch. And I said, Dad, yesterday, I said, I went to uh, the Statue of Liberty. He said, yeah. I said, after that, I went to Ellis Island, Dad. He said, really? I said, yeah. I said, Dad, they're remodeling it, but all the interview booths were like off to the side. 
I said, you know what I did there? I said, I went over, I put my hands on the counter, and then I touched the glass. He said, yeah. I said, yeah. I said, but then, Dad, that big stairway that everyone had to walk up in the center of Ellis Island, all the immigrants who came here, he said, yeah. I said, I walked up about seven or eight stairs, and I touched each stair, and then on the way down, I held onto the rail. He says, you kept eating. He says, yeah. I said, do you know why I did that? He says, why? I said, Dad, I actually thought that I could feel your footprints, and Grandma's footprints, and Uncle's footprints on the stairs. I thought I was transcending time. I thought that I could feel your fingerprints on the rail. That's why I did that. That's amazing. My father said to me, Frank, my boat docked in Providence. <laughs> I said, they're both docked in Providence. You didn't know that? <laughs> I said, there's no... <laughs> no, both, he said, I docked in Providence on the SS Victoria. So, <laughs> you know, anyway. I always, I always think though, like for for Ellis Island, like how that really because ha- it was boatloads of people every day. Yeah. And then, I mean, I wonder how Ita- like other Italians ended up in other cities, but I'm sure then they would have to get in like a bus or something and then go to other cities. Well, usually they went to places where their relatives were. Mm-hmm. You know, so what would happen here is my gra- my grandmother, you know, in, would go down to the port of, imba- of, of embarkation here, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, not far, it's only about three miles from here. And when the boat would come in, because all the immigrants would have their luggage placed on the dock that w- where they came from, their village. And my grandmother would go down to see if anyone from her village was there and say, you know, do you need any help? Do you need food? Do you need a place to sleep? So they would do that. Routinely, you know, it's just a, there were some wonderful stories. Not only her, I mean, everyone from different villages would go down to see if anyone from their village was coming. And Rhode Island had a very large popul- Italian population, and they settled in two, two major areas. One is this area called Federal Hill, and the other is another area which is a little north of here called Child Street. You know, and it's a, um, another area called Silver Lake where there was not as many, but there were Italians that settled there too. But Federal Hill was the predominant Italian section. There were, um, I was a councilman here from Federal Hill for, for eight years. And when I was here, I think there were 25,000 Italians in this, just in this district. Wow. You know, it was almost all Italian. And prior to the Italians, the Irish had lived here. You know? And so all, all the people I knew came from Italy. I actually thought, that, I'm not, this is not a joke, I actually thought when I was a kid that when you got to be like 40 years old, that you spoke Italian. Because <laughs> everyone that I knew... People that, still think that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> everyone that I knew that was older than 40, they all spoke Italian. They didn't speak English. You know? And Do you speak Italian? Very little. I can get by and I understand it. You could order food, most importantly. <laughs> I can afford food. Because they made a... My, both my grandmothers never spoke a word of English. You know, both my grandmothers. Mm-hmm. My grandfathers, they both died before I was born. Same here. It's like that for us. So I never had the opportunity to meet them or them me. And my grandmother just spoke Italian. All my aunts and uncles, I had, don't forget, 19 aunts and uncles and their spouses. That's a huge and family. Of my, of my father's family, all 10 of them, and all of their spouses, right, whoever they were, mm-hmm. not one of them, not one, went beyond the eighth grade. That's how it was then, no? I'm telling you, but... Yeah. And it wasn't unusual because up here, that, when I say up here, I mean in the Italian areas, the immigrants that came over. Don't forget, in, in 1885, in the entire United States of America, entire United States of America, there were 25,000 Italians. Which means if you put them all in Fenway Park, you'd have 13,000 empty seats. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy when you think of it like By that. By 1920, yeah. 5 million had immigrated to the United States. Yeah, that's incredible. And they, they immigrated to areas like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, yeah. Rhode Island. Real quick about Federal Hill. You were talking about Federal Hill, and mm-hmm. me and Rock were actually never seen Federal Hill. So after this, we're going to go there, take a walk. What could you tell us, maybe for somebody that's never visited Rhode Island, where it ranks amongst other little Italy's around the country? And just tell us a little bit about it, maybe some memories you have of Federal Hill. I still live on Federal Hill. I still have a house there. I still stay there quite often. I have another house in a place called Narragansett, Rhode Island, 
which is a seaside community. Uh, I never really left Federal Hill, either physically or in my heart or in my mind. You know, it's, it's where I was born and raised, and uh, I have a great deal of affection uh, for the Hill. Federal Hill is a very unique community. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and Federal Hill now, at this point in time, it is very difficult to even find a family, an Italian family living on Federal Hill. There are very, very few Italians. Very few. Everybody still moved out? Still basically? living on Federal Hill. They all moved to different towns and cities. The areas are like North Providence, Rhode Island, Johnston, Rhode Island, Cranston, Rhode Island, all areas, all cities and towns. Mm-hmm. You know, that when I was a kid, it was like going to the farm. It was you know, 10 miles from here. Oh, then we're going to go to the farm. You know? <laughs> so, uh, but there were very few Italians left. I had a wonderful, a wonderful childhood. When I told some people about my childhood, they, they would feel sorry for me. I, I started working with my father on the truck when I was 10. I delivered newspapers. Right? I, I worked in uh, putting newspapers together at 2 o'clock on Sunday morning for the Providence Journal. I shined shoes. Right? I worked in a restaurant to get through Providence College. I didn't have enough money. I didn't have enough money to go to law school. I had to teach school. Right, for two years to get enough money and then go to night school, teach school in Providence and drive nights 50 miles to Boston four nights a week. Oh, my God. It was a wonderful childhood. I loved every second of it. I have the fondest memories in the world. Right? All we had your, our, work, your work ethic is impeccable. All we had in my family was love. We knew, we knew our parents loved us so much that they would do anything in the world. You know? And we had very little, if any, Material possessions. I make quite a few public speeches, and I usually start off by saying, I want everyone to know that I led a very privileged childhood. And immediately they think, you know, I was in yachts and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, say, I had the privilege of being born poor. I had the privilege of not having any material possessions. I had the material of not being able to go to school, but I went anyway. But I was privileged that I had two parents and a family that had unquestioned love for us and set the best example in the world. And that's what life is all about. Yeah. And that's what being Italian is all about. It's all about family and desire, dedication, commitment to family, setting the example. Yeah. My, my father couldn't buy our loyalty. Not that he would. He bought our love by his love. By his love. Yeah. I treasure... <laughs> I can't even... Talk about it all because if I talk about him all I'll start crying because it's that emotional. I can I feel the emotion. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Did their parents get to see you become the man you are today? They did. They did. That's that's a major major win right there, Don. My my uh, my mom did not. Uh, my mom didn't get to see me become a judge, but my dad did. You know, I'll tell you a great story about my dad, my, my mom and dad. It, uh, <coughs> there's a little park that's right here with the with the next to this office. It was, there was a bathhouse in that park. It was a shower house, really, because we didn't have hot running water, so we used to go take the shower in the shower house. We called mm-hmm. it the bathhouse. Mm-hmm. And that was our Fenway Park. We used to play baseball. First base was a tree. Second base was a cast iron fountain. <laughs> Third base was a concrete bench. And home plate was a piece of paper, okay? That you put. And we, we used to play baseball. It was cr- you want to tell you a story about, say, like, put it... What is important to you, to me, about being an Italian? Mm-hmm. And the one thing I can tell you is respect. Respect. Now, if I were to explain respect to you, I would tell you that my godfather was my mother's first cousin. His name was Amadeo Ayavazzo. Now that's Italian. That's Italian. <laughs> <laughs> that's Italian. <laughs> In the, in the dictionary, next to Italian names, yes. they have Amadeo Ayavazzo, <laughs> right? He was my, 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 my mother's first cousin, and he baptized me. So as far as I can remember, I, I, you know, I haven't traveled far in life because my house was like about 200 feet that way. It's a parking lot now, so that's, that's where I came from. Wow. So, so Amadeo, I used to call him Amadeo. My mother would call him Amadeo, right? I used to call him Padin, and he called me Padin. Kumbar. A padron. It was 
padron. Yeah. Yeah. So he'd visit me every Christmas. Out of respect to my mother and to me, I was his godson. He'd visit me every Christmas, and he'd give me a few silver dollars. When I was 16, I'll never forget it. He said, hey, Padi, next year you're driving. I came to see you every year. You come to see me now. Right? I like that. And I did. And I did. I went to see him every year. I have five children. My first child was born. I take my first child with me. It's right there. My second child was born. Christmas Eve, I go, I buy the gift. I visit him Christmas Eve. My third child was born. Me and the third child would go, visit him Christmas Eve. Fourth child was born, the four of us would go. My fifth child, the five of us would go. <laughs> I visited him every Christmas Eve for 48 years until he died. Until he died. One year, a couple years before he died, for some reason, something was going on Christmas Eve. I said, I'll see him tomorrow. You know, I, there's no big deal about Christmas Eve, I thought. So the following day I go, <laughs> by this time, you know, my kids are all married, and uh, so I go alone. And I got the gift on my arm, and I ring the doorbell, and his wife Mary answers the door. She says, oh, thank God you came, Frank. I said, why? He said, he's in the other room sulking, oh. and he's asking, I wonder what happened. Do you think I said something to insult him? He hasn't come to see me. This, we, I, I can't believe we broke this after all these years. I said, oh, yeah. I said, let me, so I go over and I say, hey, Bobby, how are you? You know, I said, I'm sorry I couldn't make it last night. He says, I knew you'd be here today. <laughs> <laughs> all the while, he's telling his wife. I know, I love that. That's respect. Yeah. yeah. But you can't teach respect. He taught me respect by coming every single year, right? And that was a bond. He, he was my godfather. He carried me when I was born. A ta a ta it, it's respect, but it's also family. Yes. Because, you know, a lot of instances you'll see, like, a mother raises her child, and then an Italian American. I, I want to use that example, but then the mother then takes care. Yeah. You know, the daughter then takes care of the mother later on. So it's kind of like the same thing. Once you got your license, it's like, all right, now it's your turn. And sometimes that's how it is with life too. We talk about society all the time. The basic unit of society is the family unit. Basic unit of society is the family unit. As we're sitting here today. My son is here. Mm -hmm. My grandson is here. Mm -hmm. You know, and the next generation. But that's that's what that's what life is all about. I want to tell you a great story about my my father would tell me about when he was younger. And it really set to a great extent set my temperament on the bench. My father told me this. Now don't forget, my grandfather had ten kids. He was a fruit peddler. Now, I mean, you, you can't see this on camera, but there's a picture up there of my father with his push cart. Oh, yeah. Right? 1928? That was my father in 1928, right. So my father one day, he's coming with my grandfather, and you, they have to wait to get their spot where they were going to put their push cart for the day. They'd go down to the farmer's market, load up, load up the push cart, push it up the hill, right? And then the cop would blow the whistle, and they'd buy for their spots. So on this one day... It was so cold outside, and my father's there. And his father says, meet me in the restaurant. So my father's waiting and waiting. Finally, the cop blows the whistle. He finds his spot. His face is frozen. My father's face is frozen. He goes into the restaurant. My grandfather is there with all of his friends. And my father wants a cup of coffee. Right. So he says, because his face is frozen, he says, give me a cup of toffee. Tupper Toffee. From that day, from that day to the day he died, he was known as Tup or Tupper Toffee. <laughs> My mother called him Tup. Everybody called him Tup. If you came to Federal Hill in this area and asked anyone, do you know Antonio Caprio? they say, you don't know Antonio Caprio, right? Do you know Tup? Oh, yeah, everybody knew Tup. <laughs> everybody knew Tup. How did, how did uh, that show, the show that you know, they made you super viral all over the internet? Can you tell us how that came to be? I'll tell you how that happened. But before I tell you that, I'm going to tell you one other thing about my father, okay? Absolutely. Tell us. When I graduated from the, graduated from the sixth grade in school, sixth grade, my dad, I, I went home from school, and my dad was sitting there, 
And I said, Dad, would you sign my autograph book? And everybody would sign the autograph book. All your classmates. My classmates, but uh. I wanted my father to sign it. Mm-hmm. It's at my desk, but I can't get at it right now. So You're locked is in. It, is it because of the book thing? Yeah. Just lift it up. Okay, I got it. So this autograph book is 75 years old. Mm-hmm. It was 75 years ago that I placed this autograph book in front of my dad. I said, Dad, will you sign my autograph book? And here's my father who went to the seventh grade. He had his milkman uniform on. He was tired. He was sitting there like this. He took out a pen. It was like he waited. It was like he was preparing a, a formal document. And he wrote, this is my father. The street is wide. The road is long and very bumpy and very tough going. But I know that you will proceed honorably and with your head held high to the end of the highest learning. And then he signed it. He he didn't just sign it, Dad. I remember he thought, and he signed it from your dad, Antonio Caprio Sr. Antonio, Beautiful. He, he gave me a message that I mean this from my heart. It's not one of those bad, mm-hmm. you know, good luck, you know. So he gave me the message. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of Robert Frost. Somewhere ages and ages hence I shall recall with a sigh two roads diverged in the woods and I, I took the one less traveled by. Yeah. But so Frost made a reference to the road. The road, Frost says they diverged in the woods. My father said the road's bumpy and tough. Mm-hmm. You know? So he had that kind of influence, uh, influence on and me. You, you manifested it too. Yeah, well Every that, word he said. That stays with me. I may take that with me <laughs> when I go. <laughs> Guys, you heard that, right? It's <laughs> beautiful. That's, that's really, that's really touchy, man. We were talking about something else, and I detoured you. From I was gonna say um, the the show Court in Providence. Oh, yeah. By the way, the clips are all amazing. I I remember watching the show growing up, and now it's like a resurgence with social media. That these clips get millions and millions of views. So I just wanted to get the the story of how that all happened. <laughs> And um, there's like a couple of videos I want to bring up sure. and ask you like the backstory of. Sure. Yeah. Our family loves you, by the way. Yeah. My nonna watches your videos all the time. <laughs> oh, put a Frank, put a Frank on. <laughs> I feel like you're our uncle almost, like Uncle Frank. <laughs> Actually, my name is Francesco. Zio, 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 Zio Fran- Francesco. Zio Francesco. <laughs> Francesco, Cheech. Cheech, yeah. Cheech, that's right, yeah. That's Cheech, right, yeah. Call Francesco Cheech. So I have a younger brother. He's uh, 13 years younger than I am. Uh, He's the classic underachiever. He's very bright. You know, and, uh, now my older brother and I both, my brother got, when I got his master's degree, and I went out to college and worked hard. My younger brother, we well, had all the advantages because we were to help him. I made a, one tragic mistake. <clears throat> I was in the city council. I got him a summer job working in the traffic engineer department for the city of Providence. He never left. He never left. He retired after 34 years working in the traffic engineer department in the city of Providence. And when he retired, he says, Frank, you know, I know you're disappointed. I didn't go on to college because I begged them, pleaded with them. He said, I know you're disappointed. He said, but I want you to know that I loved every minute. I loved every second of working for the city in that department. He ended up being the deputy traffic engineer, so he had a good position. But he, he started off putting up signs, painting the crosswalks and all that stuff. But that made me feel good that at least he said he loved every minute of it. <laughs> but so now he's working in the traffic engineer department. He comes to me one day out of the blue. He says, Frank, you know what? He said, I've been thinking. He said, I really would love to become a videographer. I said, what, you got rocks in your head? You want to become a videographer? What do you mean you want to become a videographer? <laughs> Where did this come from? I, don't, I always wanted to do that. Now, the translation is, he said, Frank, will you buy me some cameras? That's the translation. Yeah, right? yeah, That's yeah. what he's me. Spend some money. <laughs> so, as usual, he got his way. So I said, "Okay, let's give it a shot." You know, so he he buys these 
gets, goes to New York and all of that. And he has to get the best cameras. So he gets the cameras and he comes back and he's filming graduations and stuff. Never charged these at all. Oh, I can't charge people. Can't charge people. So he, he just loved to do it. During this period of time, this, the state of Rhode Island formed a public access station. Everyone was trying to get time on public access because it was free publicity, it was free everything. So he was capable, capable of getting two hours a day on public access. Two o'clock in the morning. By the time he got his, it was going two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. so, he, so he says, Frank, I got two hours on public access. He said, I need, I need stuff to, to film. I can't fill it. He said, I can't, I, I can't even get one hour, you know, and they, they're going to take my time away from me unless I got something to, to, uh, to put on. So my wife said, why don't you film Frank's court program? And I said, absolutely not. He's not coming in my court. Of course, you know who won that argument. Right, right, right. <laughs> had, my wife hasn't lost one yet. That's how it goes, yeah. <laughs> well, the smart men make their wives always win. That's usually the way to, that's usually the way to win in the long run. You got to so pick anyway, and choose your battles. So anyway, so he, so he was very creative. So he started filming the court program. And then he would have a notice, uh, the last five minutes, call in any comments about the program. <clears throat> and some of the programs, some of the, uh, some of the episodes we had were unbelievable. The quality is so poor, we, we can't recreate it back then, you know? Right. But people would call up, and my brother was very smart, right? So if you said the most vile thing about me, and people would say, he's a guinea, he's no good, he's prejudiced. That went on, right? Yeah. If you said, he always oh, a great guy, forget it. That didn't go on, right? Because he knew. Uh, yeah, he the negative was, comments are the ones that always get responded that, he to. He knew that, those comments right. would precipitate people yeah, going yeah, up. Yeah. Right? Criticizing me, defending me. So it became very popular, you know? And so finally, now here's my poor brother. He's, he's editing, like, almost every night, sometimes to the wee hours of the morning, to do this, it takes a lot of work to do it, and then do the editing and getting it right, right. He, and it was two, and it was two hours every day, every night at two a.m. Yeah, well, you you could show the same one for three for a week, you know. Okay, 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 so, okay, okay. Yeah. So he he's there editing in a cold water flat, right? Now the flat was cold in the winter, and free and uh, warm in the summer. He'd be there editing all night. So so the key to success is right. You do that for twenty five years, and maybe maybe something good will happen. That's the key to success. In other words, success is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. Yeah. So he did that for all those years. I mean, I was on the bench and I did my job, but he did the other thing. You know, and he put the thing together and he put it on social, uh, on uh, the public access station. Mm -hmm. And we'd always would rib him and say, Joe, someday we're going to get the magic call. You're going to get the magic call from Hollywood. Someday, you know, he'd say, yeah, I hope, I hope, I hope. After 25 years, calls one day, says, guess what? He said, we're going to call from a gentleman named Brad Johnson. He represents Deadmau Mercury, the national syndicators, and they went to interview us for a national TV show. And that's how it all happened. 25 years later. 25 years later. Wow. Now, we've been doing this podcast seven years, and sometimes I'm like, oh, man. It happens. we got 18 yeah. more. 18 more. <laughs> no, it's, 18 it's not going to take 25 years, but it happens. Yeah, that's amazing. Back then, it was a little bit different. It happens. So uh, how did that meeting go? The, well, you remember the initial I meeting? Mean, well, actually... I have absolutely nothing to do with City Life production because it would be a conflict of interest for me. Yeah. So my brother, so my, it's strictly my brother's business. Right. You know? and, and my son David is the business manager for him. You know? So I get no monetary gain at all from it, which I shouldn't because I was, you know, I was a city judge. Right, right. Just, uh, you know, for popularity and, you know, what you're doing today on social media it was good for that. Well, let me tell you this. But so the question is, he said, well, "How come? How come they asked you? From, uh, they think it's me. How come they asked you from social media to go, to go on national television? Why? What was the reason?" And I said, "Well, you know, it's because they were able to track how many views right, Court in Providence was getting right. at the local TV station. Mm -hmm. So I have fun with this. I usually." We'll ask people, how many do you think, how many views do you think we had? Some people say, I don't know, 10,000. Some people say, oh, I don't know, can't be a million. You know, so they say, we had 1,800,000 views. That's phenomenal, phenomenal. 800 million, 1,800 million. 
back then. My God. It's, it's now over 6 billion views. That's viral. You know? You are the original viral. <laughs> yeah, you're probably our most viral Italian American. Yeah. Well, and I saw I, this video I, of. I, um, I, I'd be more. I'd be more interested in being. A, um, I'm not going to be a role model, but be someone that, in my same circumstances, who was just starting off in life, uh, will say, you know, I have an opportunity to do something better. Remember, I mean this. This is me. Yeah. That's where I started. That's where I started. Humble beginnings. And you can't give up. You can never quit. I don't care how bad things are, you can't quit. It taught me a great deal of lessons, not only in, in life, but in life. When I was in high school, this has nothing to do with anything, but it's not quitting. When I was in high school, my brother was a pretty good football player. And so whatever he said, I did. Back then, he was my protector. So he says, uh, you've got to come up for football. I weighed 112 pounds. <laughs> you've got to come up for football. I went up for football. I, uh, JV, I got killed. I mean, I was... <laughs> <laughs> what position did you play? I was playing uh, defensive back. Oh, right? my I'm God. Going, I'm going to tackle these kids. They shrug, uh, <laughs> me with Stiff a armor. Block. Yeah, I never gave football a shot yeah. for that reason. So I was getting killed. So, <laughs> so I'm walking down the corridor one day, and... This gentleman approaches me, teacher, one of the teachers. He was the wrestling coach, older gentleman. And he said, uh, uh, young Caprio. I says, yeah. He says, uh, uh, Mr. Beechin, he's on the wrestling coach. I said, hi, Mr. Beechin. He said, you should come up for wrestling. I said, you want me to come up for wrestling? I thought wrestling was like Gorgeous George, Argentina Roca. You know, I didn't know what wrestling was. <laughs> I said, wrestling? I said, that's too big for me. I don't know. What I don't have a clue about wrestling. He said, oh, no, no. He said, I heard about you. He said, uh, you know, he said, in wrestling, it's not like in football. He said, you're up against these 200-pound guys now. I weighed 112. He said, uh, in wrestling, you wrestle somebody your own weight. I said, you mean somebody like my size? He said, yeah, so I'll come out. So I, anyway, in the, uh, I ended up being an all-state wrestler. I'm oh. actually in the Hall of Fame. It's my trophy oh, over there. That's amazing. The Rhode, the Rhode Island Wrestling Hall of Fame. You know, yeah. so, so, you know awesome. but, but the whole, hole? But the whole point was, the whole point was, my father's, <laughs> father's, don't ever quit. Yeah. Don't ever quit. You know, don't ever give up. You know, don't ever give up. Work hard. And uh, so everything emanated. As I say, I was privileged. Had a mother who was wonderful. Mother was considered the best cook in the neighborhood, and they were some good ones. I bet. They were some good what ones. What was the best dish she made? She made everything good. I can't tell you one, one good thing, but I'll tell you this that I say, Ma, what are we having tomorrow? Right? And the answer was the same. Every every day the answer was the same. Is that what it was? Pasta fazul? Well, close. Macaroni. Macaroni, yeah. Today, today it's ziti, it's rigatoni, it's penne. It, 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 my mother said, we're having macaroni. We never knew what, what it was going to be, right? <laughs> we're having macaroni and something. The shape was a surprise. The, the yeah, rigatoni. that was it. But the uh, Sundays were great. Being Italian on Sunday, I test people's Italianism. <laughs> if there's such a word. Yeah. By asking them. I feel we always got to do that. Like, we always got to check each other. Like right now, I'm dying to ask you if it's sauce or gravy. <laughs> oh, it's gravy. It's, oh! it's gravy. He's a gravy. It's gravy. He's a gravy. My mother is saying, da, they talk sauce. What's this sauce? You know? So anyway, <laughs> We're big gravy. sauce guys. Right. How, do you, how do you test someone's italian oh, so like, some Like test us. Here's my test. All right. Tell me about Sundays in your house. Sundays. Let me tell you about Sundays in my house. Then okay. you'll understand the question. Oh, okay, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. Sundays, first of all, we had to go to church. Okay. Then we get home from church. My mother was cooking, so she was braising the brajol. Or she had the pork for the gravy, right? And she was preparing all of that. And then she started making the meatballs. And by the time we get home, she was in the middle of frying, fried the meatballs in the frying pan. So she actually didn't go to mass. Well, I'm early mass. My mother would go to early mass. She would go uh, early, and okay. she would yeah, make yeah, it yeah, back. We'd go to, we'd go to like nine thirty. So anyway, so now she's cooking, and we get home, we take the fried meatballs. Uh, as she's frying them, we start eating them, right? This is long before we start eating, right? So we have the fried meatballs. Now she makes brajol. We had to have brajol. For some reason, roasted chicken, too, Sundays, right? In the sauce or in the gravy? No, sorry. not the roasted chicken. No, okay. That's separate. That had the potatoes around it. Right? That's, okay. that's yeah, the yeah. next course. Yeah. <laughs> You're, you always know it's like four or five courses, too. Then we, we had the macaroni, whatever, whichever one she wanted, right? Mm. We had pork in the gravy. She had brajol. She used to wrap the shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me she... 
this lady used to stop her up you know, every day. She was having a little, you know, she, it's not, well, we had some issues mentally. She, and she'd say to my mother all the time, so Amanda, how do you wrap the brajol? How do you wrap up the brajol? So that was her, her big story. But anyway, it was brajol, it was the pork, it was the beef. It, uh, then we had dessert. Always, we used to go to a place called Shallow's Bakery. It's still in existence. And we have this for you there. We have the, the cream puffs and the pastries and all that. And I heard you have a sweet tooth. I do. Is that true? Chocolate cream pie, I love. Mm. One of my favorites. What do you think the best three Italian-American desserts are? That's good. That's a good question. I Your top them. three. I mean, I love them all, but I can't. But if you have to pick only chocolate three. Cream, chocolate cream pie is my favorite. Chocolate cream pie. Chocolate cream pie. What's in a good chocolate cream pie? It's Italian. It's, it's like chocolate pudding, but, the, but you gotta, you got to make the cream fresh. you got to get the, the heavy cream, whip it up, right? I don't know if I've ever had that chocolate cream yeah. pie. Yeah. Is that a Rhode Island? You've had chocolate cream pie. I don't think I have that either, yeah. Is that a Rhode Island thing? We have cannolis in Sfoyadel. I wish I knew you were coming. I wish, look. Is it a known thing? Like everybody here makes it? Or? I love um, like Sfoyadel. I like Sfoyadel and cannolis. I love those. There's a third thing. I, you like tiramisu? You like tiramisu or no? Tiramisu. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Is it in your top three? It's hard to I pick, huh? Right? I don't have a top three. They, all, <laughs> they are all so good. You mentioned me. They're all number one in my book. Hey, yeah. So I you rather it. dessert than like macaroni? No. If you had a, no, you got to have the macaroni first, no. then you get a sweet tooth well, after. Eat. No. What am I going to do with dessert? Dessert is after you finish. Yeah. <laughs> you got to sit down. You have to have to. Yeah. Everyone says pasta vazo. It's pasta vazo. <laughs> what I call a pasta vazo is pasta vazo. Yeah. You want to be aristocratic. Oh, it's. Uh, <laughs> Would you like some pasta fagioli? My mother said, pasta fagioli. My gay did. It's a pasta fagioli. It's a pasta fagioli. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> what about like, um, do you ever meet any like Italians from the other side and they say, oh, you know, it's not mozzarella. Oh, it's not mozzarella. It's mozzarella. Like, do you ever hear someone say you pronounce stuff wrong besides fagioli? Like stuff like. I, I don't call it pasta fagioli. I call it pasta fagioli. But oh, you do? Oh, yeah. So you're an aristocrat. No, that's only recent. <laughs> it always was part of the vazoo. Uh, when, when did the change was, happen the, for you? When did it become fagioli? <laughs> oh, what did it take to become? Actually, actually, it was when I was, during you know, my years in college, it was, uh, I, am the, I am the furthest thing from an aristocrat. You know, I am the furthest thing from an aristocrat. I, I told you where I am. I'm still that little kid holding the milk bottles mm-hmm. at four o'clock in the morning, right, with the broken sneakers, with the, with the briefs on. The T-shirts, the pants, it's, it was, uh, those, those days, I, the one thing is, I was bonded so f- closely with my dad, you know, he mm-hmm. was my hero, my dad's father, delivery milk. So, there's some clips that are now going viral again, because, of, you know, all the social platforms, and I always see you, like, on my feed, you know, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, all that stuff, and one of my favorite videos was this, um, Older gentleman, maybe he was like 95 or something, 92. Yeah. Victor Coelho. And he's like, I don't speed. And he's like, well, we got you on camera speeding. Victor Coelho came before the court. He was charged with speeding. And I said, Mr. Coelho, you're charged with speeding. I don't speed, Judge. I don't speed. I was taking my son for treatment for cancer. So I said, your son? I said, how old is your son? He said, my son is 66 years old. He said, hey, you never can get rid of these kids. So I try to make a joke. He said, if he is sick and I don't speed. So anyway, so we got talking about his son. You know, and uh, so obviously I dismissed the case. But I said, how old are you, Victor? At the time he was 90, I think he was 95, something like that. He was driving his 66-year-old son to, to get chemo treatment. So we followed up with Victor. And he says, you know, I'm a good cook. So I went to his house. Wow. And he baked me an apple pie. It was delicious. He gave us the recipe. And we filmed it. We put a segment on it, right? And then I invited him to my house. And he came down to my house and he made some pizza. Chocolate cream pie? Made some, no, he actually, I got to ask him about that. <laughs> he made some pizza. And then we had, we're still in touch with him almost weekly with Victor. And about, just about a month ago, he turned 100. God bless him. 
And we have we have a segment on that. So we, we went to his house. We called his daughter and said, don't let him know we're doing this. And so we sent a film crew there, and the film crew was saying, Victor, we're going to film you doing a cooking show, because we did a couple of cooking shows with Victor, right? And so now it's his 100th. He's going to be 100 the next day. And we says, so they said, the film crew, they didn't tell him I was going. They said, we're going to film you doing a cooking show. So they're filming him, and, and they're filming and Then we called until we were outside with the cake. And all that we went in and put the candles out and did all that and helped him celebrate his 100th birthday. So we stay in touch with Victor. We do that with, uh, I could go through a litany of people that we do that with. We also had a young boy come in, he was about 13 at the time, he was autistic. And one of the things he said that broke my heart was he says, I, I want to be just like everybody else, I'm not different, you know. And <clears throat> that's another long story, but we helped out his family as well. So we did that. Uh, everybody knows you as the like the kind judge. Like you let everybody off. All I do, I don't do anything special. I just do what my father taught me. That's what I do. I do what my father taught me. You should me. practice in New York, you know. <laughs> <laughs> my father delivered milk. The company told him, if people don't pay the milk for two weeks, you're going to stop the milk. You can't deliver it. My father said, if they have kids, I'm not stopping the milk. He, he had his own rule. He said, I'm not stopping the milk. For people, if they have kids, what are the kids going to do? And many times the company would put pressure on him. He said they're trying to pay. They put a dollar down. He take it out of his pocket, or two. He said no, they put two dollars down. They're trying to, they're trying to pay. You know? That's nice, though. That well, those were my influences. I mean, that's, that. you see where the values come from. Yeah. Uh, I know you. You have the final say, obviously, in the courtroom. But is the city ever like upset? Like, oh, you land too many. Uh, you're They're bypassing too many whips. tickets. There's we need big, to get out some fines. There's a, big, <laughs> there's a big front page newspaper article hanging on the wall up there. I'm in Chambers one day. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. City Hall wants Providence Court to change its forgiven ways. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Chambers one day. The clerk says, the finance director's here. I said, finance director's here. Really? Yeah. So what's, what's he want? So he comes in. He says, you know... Uh, I'm checking the finances of the city and so forth, and we expected you to bring in X amount of dollars last last year, and you didn't bring in that X amount of dollars. And, uh, you know, he says, we actually know, we see some of your videos, and we think you're being a little too lenient, and we need more money. I said, I thought I was elected a judge, not a revenue enhancement agent for the city. Yeah. He said, well, more, more people thought like you like traffic cops. Well. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I wasn't nice. I was, I was kind of tough with him, you know. He was like, put off, and I didn't care. You scared him? I didn't scare him. He, he he was part of City Hall. I'm different. You know? I thought you would have got the wrestling way. Give him a little chicken oh, wing I, or something. I, I, there would be no contest. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> if I challenged, if I went at him, he'd probably faint of a heart attack. Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to do that to the poor. He's a finance guy. Right? Yeah. You give him a pen, he'd be okay. But you want to do yeah. this. He, he's not ready. You, you got him. Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready for you. Come on, baby. <laughs> you, so anyway. I wouldn't pay got, to see that. You got him there. <laughs> <laughs> what was the other video you wanted to bring no, up? I, there was one where uh, you had uh, two parents, and then you asked the, you brought the little kid up. Like, oh, what do you think your father is, guilty or not guilty? Oh, yeah, yeah. And the kid goes, guilty. <laughs> and the, know, the whole courtroom was laughing. You know what was great about that? What was great about that was they had recently, within the last six months, come from Africa, that family. Wow. And they, they just, just started driving. They had right? just come to this country. Now, j just imagine. Yeah. Like, that little kid is there. You saw it was the cutest little yeah, kid, so right? Yeah, so cute. So he's there. They came from Africa. They were in the United States of America. His mother's carrying another baby, right? Mm -hmm. And they're in a courtroom. I got a robe on. It's a very intimidating experience. For now, sure, right? yeah. Now, just imagine if I now say to the father, your son was in the car. What kind of a father? And I start yelling at the father and berating him, right? And I'm going to find you the maximum. We're going to teach you a lesson. But that kid would leave the courtroom. He'd, he'd be traumatized. For sure. Traumatized. You never know how that would influence his view toward the institutions of government in the future. I want to tell you a story about that. My father told me this story. My grandfather, I, I forget this story earlier. My grandfather's peddling fruit one night, he and his buddies. Saturday night, they finish, they get a gallon of what they get, and they start having a few drinks, they're playing cards, they get rowdy, my grandfather gets arrested. Gets arrested. Oh, wow. Um, some of my grandmother's friends go to the house and say, my grandma's name is Carolina. Carolina, you know, Antonio, he's in jail. He's going to be in jail. You've got to go to court tomorrow morning. 
or whatever, whatever it was. He said, go to court. Yeah, he said, jail. You're going to go to court. You'll see the judge. So my father, she takes my father to court because my father spoke English. Right? <clears throat> my father's a teenager at the time. Right? So now she, she's nervous. My husband's in jail. So she goes to the other fruit peddlers. She tells all the fruit peddlers, I got to go to court. My husband's in jail. I got to get him out of jail. I got to borrow some money. She didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. So they all give us some money to help her out to pay the fine to get her husband out of jail. It's a cold day outside. In those days, she didn't have coats. She wore three dresses. She, so she had three dresses on. She had the money in the inside dress. Mm -hmm. They go down to the court. My father's there. The court's jammed. They bring up my father, my grandfather, from the cell. He's disheveled. He slept on night and everything mm -hmm. else. My father's just like this. He said, Frank, he said, the judge was this stern ruddy faced Irishman with white hair. He says, What a man he was. What a man he was. I said, Yeah, that. He says, My mother jumped up. Before I could say anything, my father's telling me. She reaches in. She says, Judge of the, judge of the, please, uh, please, uh, no jail. The money. I go to the money. Please, uh, no, ja no jail. <laughs> my father says, The judge leaned back and said to me, Tell your mother I'm sending her husband home. Because he's a good man. Tell her he's, he had a bad night, and I understand that. Right? Tell her to cook him a good meal. <laughs> right? and I want she made macaroni for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I want her to t take good care of him so he can take care of his family. My father says, what a great Irishman he was. What a great Irishman. I often wonder, I often wonder, if that judge had taken a different tack in a berated my grandmother yelled at my grandfather mm -hmm. and everything else. You know what they wonder? If my father would have said, you know, what's, I wonder how that would have affected him. I know that he had such a profound love for this country and the systems of government. But you never know how that's going to turn out. But I always remember that story. And you talk about how I treated people in court. I don't do anything else except what I was taught at home. Yeah. Treat people with kindness, compassion, understanding, and sympathy. You're truly one of a kind because you don't. There's <laughs> not, not many. Yeah. You're one of the great ones. <laughs> well, as Sonny would say, I want, actually <laughs> wanted to talk about Providence real, just, real quick I'm because just a, just a kid named Frankie from Federal Hill. That's all I am. So one one question: If you had to make uh, a sixty second commercial on why you should visit Providence, Rhode Island, what would you say? Maybe give me you know your favorite places or what you could do and. Providence, Rhode Island, is a um, is a wonderful place to visit. We have we have different ethnic groups here. You can you feel comfortable. We have a diverse population. We have a beautiful zoo. It's one of the best in the country, right? And we have the best restaurants, or close to the best restaurants in the country. I think they're the best. But our, our Italian food is, is is considered, you know, unbelievable. So it's a wonderful place to live, enjoy life, live, eat. Go to school. We have some great uh, educational institutions here. We have Providence College, Brown University, Johnson and Wales, Bryant University. I was speaking to your son earlier, and he was. T I saw a video actually as well where you say "ah beats" and you say "ah bast." No. So you put an "a" in front of the the it's word. Beats. Be they say pizza. It's not pizza. It's "ah beats." "Ah beats." You want "ah beats?" You got to buy "ah beats." So we we got to bring this up. On the way here, <laughs> you noticed that we were driving past New Haven, Connecticut. And a lot of people in New Haven call it our beats. Are you picking New York or Connecticut pizza? If you had to pick one. This is a serious question, Frank. <laughs> this I mean, is more serious answer, than sauce and gravy. The answer is I pick Rhode Island, but <clears throat> Rhode Island pizza. Why does everybody lately think their their city has the best? <laughs> we had a guy from Toronto say Toronto I never heard anything about Toronto pizza. It's a big Italian population in Toronto. Yeah, there is, yeah. there is. The What's popular. a Rhode Island pizza? Does it it's, have clams on it? It's nice and thick. Yeah? Nice and thick. Delicious. It's a square? Well, it's whatever, it's whatever size you want. Mm -hmm. If you buy it there, it come, they'll, they'll serve it to you. It's round, right? Mm -hmm. But they have the squares, you know, the slice, slices of pizza. They have uh, pepperoni and cheese. Delicious. Then we have something that nobody else in the world has. It's called a Wimpy Skippy. Wimpy, a wimpy Skippy. It's yeah, named after two gentlemen, Wimpy Wimpy, which was his nickname. Mm -hmm. That's Skippy. a horrible nickname. Yeah. Wimpy. Wimpy. <laughs> Wimpy. Wimpy was in the Normandy invasion. 
There was no wimp. Oh, yeah, no, no. What was no it? Wimp. Yeah, he got, hum- he got humbled real quick. So he's deceased now. Oh, rest in peace. Yeah. They named, they named this concoction a wimpy skipper. You should have it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you one before you leave. What is it? it? It's a... Um, you want to surprise I'll us? I'll tell you what it is now. It's a, um, it's a spinach pie with uh, a slice of... What's in it? Pepperoni cheese, something else. Pepperoni cheese and spinach? It's, it's spinach, olives, pepperoni, and melted cheese. Is it ricotta in cheese? Of, in the form of a... Uh, calzone? Of a calzone, yeah. Uh, also, it's like a roll. Is it mozzarella cheese or ricotta inside? No, it's not ricotta. Oh, okay, so like mozzarella. Calzone, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, sounds good. What's one thing... I mean, you know, we're here for a reason today, you know? Your family, we get a, a message from your Instagram account, like let's do an interview with Big Frank. So we got excited, and we just want to know like what's something you want to tell all of our Italian American followers around the world about yourself that maybe they don't know or you want them to know. I'm going to quote Martin Luther King. He says, "We we may all have come over here on different ships, but we're all on the same boat now." In the United States, unless you're a native-born American, we all have ancestors that came from someplace else. So I'm not into this. I've been here for 100 years. I don't care how many years you've been here. You you came in yesterday, you came in 100 years. You're all equal in my eyes. That's what America is all about. We're all equal. So we're here to help each other. I'm proud to be an Italian. I'm very fortunate. I think I'm fortunate. I'm 100% Italian. Both my parents, all their relatives came from Italy, and I'm here as a result of that. But it's not like where we came from, it's what we do in life. You know, it's just that it's very simple. It's the old adage that we were taught, like from the Bible, treat people, you know, as you want to be treated. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very easy. It takes, it takes less effort to be kind and considerate than it does to be upset and angry and yell at people. Love that. So, it's to me, to me, we're all we're all brothers and sisters. I don't care what color you are, I don't care what your ethnic background is. We're all brothers and sisters at the final analysis. We all have a human nature. We all feel hurt. We all have emotions. We all have, particularly parents. We all have the same dreams and aspirations for our children, so that they will succeed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I mean, you know, I indicated earlier. My, Came from, came from humble beginnings, and I'm the beneficiary of the largesse of this country, the greatness of this country. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the one thing I think that distinguishes the United States from any other country is opportunity. Here, mm-hmm. you have the opportunity; you have to grab it, mm-hmm. and to grab the rung, and run with it. But you have that opportunity. So I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. <clears throat> it took me a little, I had a little steeper slope to climb to get there, mm-hmm. but you just never quit. On behalf of me, Rocco, all growing up with time, we really appreciate your time reaching out to us and, and doing this because you are very important to us Italian-Americans. You pretty much raised us all, and we were rooting for you as kids. Once we saw the vowel at the end of your name, <laughs> we automatically <laughs> loved you. So um, on behalf of me, Rocco, I'm, Absolutely. You know, thank you so much for all this time you gave us and I love all the stories. I appreciate you coming. I enjoyed it very much. Likewise, Thank you so likewise. Much. Thank you so much. We'll put we'll put links in uh, the description for everybody to follow you. And uh, thank you so much for your time.